not a garbage. So, um, yeah, can I just sure. real quick? Mm -hmm. so um, that we have, we we've been aware of this mm -hmm. situation since July, and have been in very frequent communication with the city with Tara to make sure that we can move as fast as we can. I mean, there are three parties that are really involved in mm -hmm. in remedying this situation and making sure that we can um, submit the proper documentation for the renewal process to the city clerk's office as soon as possible. Um, and all of those uh, parties are working in concert together. So that's a that's sort of a status update and the, the discovery moment that we had that was painful and scary. But we're doing everything that we can. We've acknowledged the situation in full and are now since July, been moving forward and making sure that we're staying on top of things as, as needed. So basically what the situation resulted in is that the dat database, um, we received it three and a half months <coughs> later than the timeline. It had about 400% of the work we anticipated. Um, and we still managed to get the database done within the three months we had budgeted for the original work. But what it means is that that three and a half months we lost at the beginning, we have not made it up. So we are, our entire renewal is still running three and a half months behind. We have endeavored to try to catch up a little bit on that, and I will say, I must say that thus far, and, I'm, and I asterisk this as thus far, the city has not been a source of delay on this one. Sometimes they are on some of these bids, sometimes we have to really wait for staff to review things. On this particular one, we're already, um, we should, I believe we should be close to a final database very soon. We have been through two rounds of their comments, um, uh, and we're about to submit it back again. Um, so the city actually goes through, verifies all this data, asks us questions about various items, they create a comments column, and then we go back and address all of their comments or questions. Um, so we certainly hope that that will be finalized soon. It is, it is impossible to fully complete the MDP or the engineer's report without a database that has been approved by the city because the, both documents contain an inordinate amount of numbers that change with every change to the database. Um, so the MDP is actually, uh, which is my area, is as done as I can make it now. It is, um, I have a copy, uh, a draft copy if any of you wish to look at it here. I didn't make a lot because it's a gigantic document and I didn't want to kill that many trees. Um, but it is, it is missing um, all of the charts and tables. It's missing all the numerics, all the budget numbers, etc. cetera. Um, and it's missing the parcel roll. Um, and there are a few sections of my MDP that come from the engineer's report. So there's a few sections of text that will need to be updated when Ed has his. Um, so what happens next is that Ed creates, um, when we have, actually he's going to start on the ER now, um, but once we have the, find, the database approved by the city, then we can add in all the numbers and all the tables as well. He and I have a period of usually about a week or two where we go back and forth and reconcile any issues between our documents. They're interdependent in many ways. Um, and then we submit our documents to the city for review. Um, I believe um, that the city will, will certainly try to do their best. Um, they are, just as we are as a consulting firm, they are dealing with multiple bids seeking to renew, and so it, it um, turnaround and timeline can vary tremendously based on what else is coming in. So they tend to process things in the order received, um, generally speaking, so it is, you know, it is always a bit of a wild card. We don't know for sure. Usually when I ask them for timelines on turnaround, they come and go. <laughs> They're not very good at estimating timelines typically. Um, but I believe that they will do their best. Um, I don't see, sorry, to be realistic, I don't see a likely scenario where um, we avoid manual billing. I do, however, as I passed out a timeline to you here, um, I do believe we will renew before the year end. I believe we can renew um, uh, in by early October. So I don't think there will be any delay in renewing the bid or any gap, but I do think annual billing is nearly certain at this point. Um, so, so what that means, um, we have been on manual billing for South Park 2 mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> for the first year of its existence, and we will, if 
uh, if what looks likely actually does occur, which is that we can't avoid manual billing for the renewal process, it's just for the first year. Right. So it's going to be painful for staff, but only for one year, which is a silver lining, I think. Or yes. it's not as bad as it could be. <laughs> so um, <coughs> what manual billing means for those of you who are less familiar with it is that, um, uh, so for new bids, and this is technically considered a new bid because you are combining two, it is not a straightforward renewal of one. Um, new bids um, are required, uh, the <coughs> county assessor's office, which sends out the tax bills, normally speaking, your bid assessment appears on your property tax bill as a separate line item. Um, and it's split into two installments that go out spring and fall. Um, in order to make those tax bills, um, the county assessor requires that new bids, that the city submit the assessment role for new bids by July 15th. July, by July 15th, that means city council has to have approved the bid. The, they used to fudge that a little bit, um, but now they ask for the ordinance of establishment and they ask for the count record of the council file to show that council has adopted it. Council also takes a three week recess in July. So practically speaking, what it really means is that any new bid that wants to make the regular tax rolls has to be done before the July 4th weekend. Uh, the recess typically starts with the July 4th weekend. That timeline is, is virtually undoable for us. Um, and even for renewing bids, I believe the assessor requires it, I think it's August 1st. I may be off by two weeks. It's either August 1st or August 15th. Um, so that is probably an unrealistic scenario for us. Um, what happens with manual billing is that for the first year of the bid, the city clerk's office, the city, will issue a separate bill to all the property owners in the district instead of it coming from the county assessor. What that means are two things. One, the clerk will bill the entire assessment for the year in one bill, so it doesn't get split into two as the property taxes do, it goes out as one. Um, it typically means um, that you will have more more inquiries and some some definitely higher complaint levels, um, and those calls will go often to the county uh, assessor and the city clerk, and they will generally refer them to the bid. Um, on South Park Two, we had that situation, um, and uh, I also went out. Um, Jessica and I spent a good deal of time going out and reaching out to some of those property owners who were upset. Um, and I think with one or two exceptions, we're able to resolve those. I think there were one or two property owners that remain. But they also are simply opposed to the bid, but I don't think it was particularly in the building. So it does create some additional work. It creates some additional work for the city. It creates some additional work for us. Um, so. Now, the new bid being South Park in its entirety, mm -hmm. that's all manual building? building? Yes, the whole thing. It's going to require a massive amount of um, communication, mm -hmm. a huge communication strategy to explain to property owners who have been used to paying their assessments a certain way um, that they're going to see it differently for a year. And what's the penalty when property owners resist and don't like to pay? So one of the things when the county assessor, when the county assessor bills your assessment, if you don't pay it on time, um, the bid assessment is subject to the same fee and penalty structure as they impose for the property taxes. And I don't recall off the top of my head what that is. But they hit you with the same exact same penalty structure as you get for paying your property taxes late. When the city does manual billing, one of the things they actually do, they ask the bid how you want to handle that. And so they allow you, you can set um, a range. You can, uh, they can do anything from zero penalty for late payment up to, I think, what whatever it is that the county assessor charges, um, which I think is, is you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna speak incorrectly. Um, so we, we have a choice. So we don't uh, necessarily have to impose a penalty. We can ask for some flexibility um, within a range. They'll work with us on when does that penalty occur. If we select a penalty, when does that penalty occur? Do you want that to get 30 days late, 45 days late, 60 days late? 
there are some limitations based on what they can do with their within their building system within because that's done by the controller. Um, but we have some flexibility there in determining those things. And so obviously, given our late renewal, we might want we, we, we would want to balance making sure that the bid has the resources it needs to continue services uninterrupted with some leniency in that regard. Um, also, um, it is not um, it is not advisable to broadcast this because pe people who perhaps don't need it will plead hardship. But in most bids with manual billing, um, if there are property owners who plead, uh, who can make a credible case for hardship, as in, I am I'm a wholesaler and I do a huge amount of purchasing in this month to get ready for the holidays. I can't afford to pay this assessment right now. I can afford to pay it in three months. Things like that. You know, if there are situations like that on a case by case basis, we can take them to the city clerk's office and try to get some some leniency. Have that person's payment split into two payments, or get them some 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 additional time to pay that without a penalty. We don't like to advertise that too much because everybody likes to keep money in their pocket. So we want to want to try to reserve that for people who seem to have a really genuine question. I think the biggest thing, from my understanding of this whole process, that we need to be aware of is is how much is making sure that um, we have enough money at the beginning of the year to continue operations as needed. Um, because we have to spend down, at the end of the life cycle of the bid, we have to spend down the mm -hmm. money that we've had from the previous five years. So we're almost starting from square one, and then to enact this, this new policy in, uh, of, of um, receiving assessments, is we just need to be aware of that first like quarter mm -hmm. that we have enough in our coffers. Do you have to spend it down? Yes. Is it required? Can I be refunded to the any unspent? Yeah. Okay. So any carryover funds from South Park, the existing South Park or South Park two bids, they can, if if any of that money is not spent, um, it has to go into a separate pot of money that can be used for one-time projects, but it cannot be used as operating capital for general budget categories. Um, it is each basically each bid is an authorization unto itself. So South Park two funds cannot be rolled over into the next bids management. Nor can same same is true of both bids. Um, and in general, um, if you have a substantial amount of carryover funds, the city clerk's office will um, get on you because you're not you're not spending money according to the way you said you would in your management plan. So if you're accruing a large carryover amount, um, you know. Five five percent maybe is reasonable. When you start getting above that, they'll say, "Why aren't you spending the money as as you would have?" So, generally, bids are not intended to carry over large amounts, but most bids carry over something because it's very hard to budget a hundred percent and spend every dollar right on the day. So there usually is a carryover amount, um, but usually not. Right. You want it not to be very large relative to your budget. Is there always a carry amount, or is it sometimes a deficit? Um, usually I don't believe in our history there's been a deficit. I'm trying to say, I'm sure there has probably been a bid that did. Um, and I don't know how, I cannot think of one in particular. Um, most bids are smart enough not to do that. Um, but I'm sure it has happened. I can ask. I don't know how such a situation was going And the carryover amount, I should say too that like, because we're at the tail end of the life cycle, that's, that's why the situation is um, what it is, which is that we need to ensure that we have enough money in the in for that first quarter because it's the brand new life cycle of this new bid. Um, and so, if our spending does go to plan, which it sh I mean it will, that's what we, we've we've planned for. Um, we will need to make sure we're collecting assessments as soon as possible. Um, now there are some some pluses, like for example, I know you have some city-owned property in the bid. <coughs> right. Once you once the city the city will um, because this is a new bid, it's not technically the same as before. The city will have a new contract for you, and they will also have to establish a new bid account. They'll wind up eventually killing off your other two, and they'll create a new bid account. Once that bid account is created, the city tends to. Uh, just electronically transfer whatever their assessment payments are. So, for example, you'll get the city funds 
a lot faster generally than you will get with the individual checks from property owners. That said, with manual billing, and I, you know, there are no guarantees, but I will say that still, even with manual billing, a high number of people pay their assessment on time. And you also, one of the things you have going for you, in a sense, is that the city clerk's office doesn't, it, it's very simply, it's so much extra work for them, they prefer to do the one billing and not the two as the assessor does. Um, by billing the entire assessment at the start of the year, you actually can <coughs> potentially collect revenue faster than you would have if you went the other approach. So in other words, the anybody who's delinquent, slow pay, or complaining may be offset by people who simply pay their full assessment on time. So you see how you may not have as big a budget issue. Um, you can't guarantee any of that, but generally, hopefully that's not a big issue. When does the city issue the single bill? Um, uh, the billing, uh, so the steps that actually go into it, once council approves the bid, right. um, they actually, it usually, if they line things up correctly, they can usually publish it within, so that, actually the city council action has to be signed by the mayor, so if the city council sends it forthwith, that happens very quickly. Once it's signed by the mayor, they prepare the ordinance for publication. Usually that can be done in as little as a week to 10 days. Um, once the ordinance is published, it has a 30-day effective date. Um, usually during that window, the city will start preparing the contract for you to sign. Um, once you execute the contract, and keep in mind, with the contract, you have to submit a couple of forms um, with regards to various attestations of compliance with various city policies, etc. And you also have to have proof of insurance. So one of the things that you may want to keep in mind and have queued up is that you will want to have your insurance um, revised or adjusted appropriately for the new bid. Um, it will be required. The minimums are general liability, workers' comp, um, and they don't. They specify limits for those. Um, on auto, they don't specify a specific limit, but they require that you meet uh, California law on, all, on the auto coverage. So those are things they will look for proof of at the time you sign the contract. So making sure you have that done will speed things along. Um, once the contract is signed, they will request that the controller create um, a bank account for the bid. Um, and then once that is created, that usually takes about one to two weeks, the money can start to come in. So once the account is created, um, the city will also issue the billing around that time. And I apologize, all, all the answers to everything I do are not simple. <laughs> They're all com complex. So this is a very technical form of consulting and it's hard to retain it, so feel free to ask me uh, any questions. So this process is two months, two to three months, based okay. on the okay. council approval, mayor's signature, the effective date, 30 days out, Yes, I would say it can be less than that, um, given that you're renewing late, I think, and also that tends to be not as busy a time of year for the city, a, a bit less. Um, ideally, they can speak that up a bit. I've seen it running probably less than that. Things by your well. Did you have a question? Sorry, I was late, so I didn't know mm -hmm. this rest already. What, isn't there, is there going to be another vote given to the, any other, another round of ballots given to the <coughs> Yes, so in order to renew, um, we will be sending out uh, petitions which to all property owners, which um, will have to be collected. Uh, that's basically a, allows property owners to say, yes, we want this to go to vote. We want to be able to vote on the um, existence of a bid. Once we collect those, it actually goes to ballot, and then those ballots will be sent out and will be collected. Is yeah. there any, have you had any preliminary ideas on the assessment amounts? That's actually are they going a up or good segue. Going down? Are they going sideways? Or, yes. Sorry, are you property owner? I'm sorry, I don't think mm -hmm. we've met. Okay. South Park team. Great. Thanks for joining us. And, and that's next on our agenda. So we're going to oh, get to that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so then, any other questions? <coughs> just sum this up. Uh, so mm -hmm. the board's yeah. fully aware yeah. um, and familiar with what some of the next steps are generally. So yes. They'll be getting the same information. Yes. You know, 
discussing today is the next board packet mm -hmm. update. It's correct. Um, all right, so uh, any other questions on the renewal before I seg into a, 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 an assessment issue? All right, hearing none. Um, so one of the things, um, uh, I am the consultant who helped uh, form South Park 2. I was not the <coughs> consultant who did your last renewal of South Park. Um, so one of the things, um, that is my fun task, is to live with um, the work that was done by uh, prior consultants. So to that end, I'm going to pass this out briefly. And I don't know that you necessarily need to read it, but feel free to reference it as much as you like. Um, we have one issue that's arisen. Uh, oh, it was. I'm sorry. Um, so when we formed South Park 2, um, the intention was that it would join South Park, original South Park. Um, and there, there's no problem with that. But we do have one issue because of uh, a combination of two things. We're, we're a bit, um, we're between a rock and a hard place. So what I've passed out to you is one rock. And the hard place is the fact that um, the South Park and South Park 2 boards um, made a decision over the last few years to raise assessments in South Park, but not in South Park 2. That is not an issue, um, that is not an issue that we can't address for the majority of parcels, but we do have an issue when it comes to residential condos. And this is not commercial condos. Commercial condos are treated like all other properties, like commercial properties, etc. But when it comes to residential condos, assessments were raised in South Park 1. I'm going to use 1 to help make it clear. In South Park 1, your current rate for residential condos is actually about 33 cents. At the time of your last renewal, it was 30 cents. So the increases, um, there were, I think, at least two years where you, you um, put in increases in South Park. So the net result is that South Park's condo rate is currently at 33 cents. It's, it's 0 0.33075, but effectively 33 cents. Um, and in South Park 2, if, if the current bid were not um, sunsetting, your rate is still 30 cents. So there were no increases made in South Park 2. Our issue is, and what I passed out, this is an excerpt of just two pages from the last South Park Management District plan, the one that we did not do. So your plan has a, a, very, a very thorough um, and very good, but also rather limiting um, justification for how um, for why residential condos are assessed differently than other parcels. And it is, as I said, a good justification. It is um, very thoughtful. But <coughs> with this um, rationale, it is very hard for me to come up with any rationale for why residential condos should be 33 cents in, in all of the bid except for South Park 2. There is really no logical rationale for me to offer um, to say that those residential condos should be three cents less. Does that, does that make sense? So what this means is that um, in South Park 2, with the renewed bid, um, most parcels will not, not see any change. But for those parcels, and, and quite frankly, if, if I recall correctly, Almost none of the residential condos that are being developed in South Park 2 have yet been recorded. Very, very few. I think there's one building and there's not even full data for that building yet. So this is not going to affect any existing residential condo owner. No residential condo owner is going to see an increase from 30 cents a square foot to 33 cents a square foot. Um, but for the developers of those properties, I want you to be aware that your rate when those condos are recorded is going to be 33 cents a square foot and not 30 cents. And I, I know that um, I think in the interest of transparency it's important because I think there were just, I understand there were discussions in South Park 2 about not raising assessments. Now one of the ways that we can also deal with this in terms of equity 
is that we're going to put language in the plan, um, and I, I certainly, I think there's good rationale for it, um, but we'll put language in the plan such that in South Park, actually in any part of the bid, assessment rates can be raised in one zone, but not necessarily, it doesn't have to be raised in all zones. So for example, if you as a board decide that zone three is underserviced and you want a little more revenue to work with in that zone, that you can raise assessments by zone rather than as it is a whole. Um, and that actually makes sense because that the uses in areas change over time and you're certainly seeing that in South Park. So um, what I would say is this. So for example, the condo rates in South Park 2 will be 33 cents per square foot. However, if after the first year you think that's meeting the need um, for residential condos, you could make the decision simply to only raise assessments on the commercial, the non-residential condo properties. So this is kind of a minor issue. It's, it's more of a technical issue. But it does technically have an economic impact on those folks that will be bringing residential condos to market. Um, and so I wanted to show that with you and why and how that approach. Just to make sure I'm clear. Mm -hmm. so, how, how, so how will you rationalize taking South Park 2 from 30 to 33 cents? You said you couldn't, so, you, you can't rationalize keeping them different. So mm -hmm. how do you? So keep in mind, when you renew the bid, you can change boundaries, <laughs> assessment structure. You can change any and all of that. We're not changing any of that with this one exception. So. South Park 2's residential condo rate in the old plan was 30 cents. It will now be 33. So in other words, we don't have to rationalize a, a movement upward because this is a new plan. Um, but because of this extensive language in your original South Park plan, I think it would be unwise um, to try to establish two residential condo rates that are very close. You would have to have a really clear and extensive rationale for that, and we couldn't think and, of one. And, and, <laughs> and you're saying renewable, but, but mm -hmm. again, what you're I'm sorry. clearly saying is it's a new bid. New bid, yes. Brand new bid. So sorry. Yes. that would be the reason this is a new bid and these are the rates. Okay. Yes. So this is a new bid. And as, as I said, I don't believe there's, there's no one in South Park 2 now. Um, to my knowledge, I have to go back and triple check this, but I believe there are no res residential condos being assessed yet at 30 cents per square foot rate. None of them have come to market yet. So there's no one, There's no on the practical level, there's no one who's going to see their, their assessment suddenly go up. But for those who own the properties, if you had happened to sit down and run the calculations for your property, roughly what your, what your units were and that sort of thing, you would have done so at 30 cents a square foot, and I wanted to let you know that it's actually going to be 43 cents. So. And what were your suggestions about non-residential? Non-residential, this is not an issue at all. This is only a condo issue, and it's because, um, you know, there are some, some bids that assess residential condos by the same formula as commercial. Um, but many of them are like your bid where they establish a flat rate per square foot. To be honest, if you actually kind of work out the math, like if you take a commercial condo in your district and a residential condo in your district, and so the commercial condos are assessed by the combination of frontage, lot, and, um, and building, just as any commercial property is, and the residential condos have a flat rate for an interior, interior building pad, the square foot of the unit, square footage of the unit, they actually don't work out to be hugely different. They're relatively comparable. They're within, usually, usually with, if you compare a commercial condo of the same size to a residential condo of the same size, I don't think you get more than a 10 to 15% irrigation. It's actually pretty similar. And apartment projects, uh, same assessment? Apartment, pro uh, apartment buildings are considered commercial operations, so they're not, uh, condos are subdivided, um, and, and for those who are less familiar with land use stuff, condos actually what happens is you take one parcel or a couple of parcels and you subdivide it into say a hundred condo parcels and then each person who owns one of those owns a little parcel within a parcel so to speak or a parcel within a, a plot of land. Um, apartment buildings that's not the case it's the apartment building re remains one parcel owned by one owner. Um, All those projects 
will still have condo maps, but they yes. rent as apartments. It's just a strategy in the future sometimes. Yes, and so in that case, what matters is whether or not the condo map gets recorded. So some people get the vesting tentative track map, but don't record it. In that case, you're going to be treated as a commercial use. You're going to still get assessed for that one parcel. Um, if you record the condo map, but don't sell the condos, then you're going to be paying the condo assessments for each of those units. So that's really what matters is whether or not the best, the, te uh, the uh, final track map gets recorded with the assessor. Usually, most most developers who don't proceed with condos, if they get the track map and decide to go apartments, generally don't record the track map. So usually, they're paying. For the so there's there's a the, the entitlement process is with the city, but when you subdivide that. For, for the bids purposes, it doesn't matter until that gets recorded with the assessor. And if it's never recorded with the assessor, then as far as, as for our purposes, it's not a condo, it's a permit building. But in the final analysis, the pricing differential is... It's not huge, no. It's actually, it's actually modest. I, I ran that calculation when we did South Park 2, so it's been about two years. But my recollection is that it was not more than a 10% 10, 10 to 50% variation tops. I think, res, as I recall, residential condos are a tad higher. And that kind of reflects the fact that they are sort of 24-hour owners in a sense. So they have, they have higher needs than somebody who is maybe there for 12 hours a day. But it's not huge. It's it's a um, it's one of those things. If someone questioned, you can really look at it and see it makes common sense. To pull it, if you pull it apart. Questions at all for uh, Tara about assessments? <clears throat> I guess one question would be just going forward, given the mm -hmm. manual uh, accounting mm -hmm. uh, starting next year. Staffing perspective. Staff handle that. Great question. Option to have parallel support as well. Um, for the preparation part of that, um, between now and the end of the year, Tara is going to remain as our consultant. And as of yet, we have enough bandwidth on our staff side to be handling this. I mean, this is um, my priority as ED mm -hmm. right now. Um, and, you know, if and when we get to the point of that um, communication campaign and making sure that we're um, alerting property owners that this is, that petitions are going to be sent out and here's the timeline and this is what it means, um, this is going to be an all hands on deck kind of thing. Um, but I don't foresee anything slipping through the cracks and if that is the case, we have the bandwidth to, to expand our staff, but um, like, you know, interns, and it, it's going to be a lot of stuffing mm -hmm. envelopes and that kind of thing. Um, beyond that, in terms of the actual manual billing process, um, that's something that I need to have a conversation with Tara about because I have never been a part of what it looks like to handle manual billing for a year, um, and that, you know, we need to make sure that we are fully um, capable of handling whatever that load looks like. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, in terms of um, expectations, both mm -hmm. both my time and staff time, the heavy demands will fall. The heaviest single demand will fall in the week or so before we go to petition and the petition stage. So, collecting petitions um, uh, from property owners uh, who represent. 50% plus one dollar of assessments is really the biggest hurdle. Um, in that period, one of the things you can do to support staff is not ask them for too much help if you can, or wait, or be patient, or that sort of thing. Because at that point, for many of the staff, you know, renewal will be at least a half-time job for them every day. Um, reaching out to all the property owners, having those conversations, and we certainly help and assist with that. We do the vast majority of the document preparation related to that. 
including the petitions. Um, the petitions sometimes need to be revised. For example, sometimes we discover during the petition process that the legal owner has changed since the database was last verified. So then we have to, we actually have to redo the petition, correct the legal name of the owner, and regenerate it. So there are all sorts of technical things that come up during this, and we provide all of that technical support. Usually the bid is, is um, we can certainly help with drafts, but the bid is more responsible usually for the cover letter that goes out in those packets. And usually we recommend just a simple one-page promotional uh, piece that kind of identifies the achievements of the bid. So those two things will be uh, things that the bid will create more so than us. The other documents that go in those packets are basically um, prepared by us. We put them in usually a PDF or PDF portfolio, furnish it to them with clear sort of printing um, and assembly instructions. And for many of my bids, like for instance, if you guys get interns or stuff to come out and help do it, I can even go over and spend you know an hour or two with them going through it and making sure it does get something done. And we'll be, um, I will be uh, tapping board members for help um, to collect petition signatures and ballot signatures. Um, I understand in the past that that's been um, very helpful in the collection of those signatures and that um, board, board members are uh, uniquely positioned to be collecting those. So, heads up. <laughs> I'll put that another way. At, at the end of the day, for for many of your property owners who are <coughs> harder to get their attention um, or less involved, perhaps with the properties in particular, peer-to-peer -peer conversations. At, at the end of the day, I'm a consultant. They're staff. We are paid to do this, and and when the conversation originates from a property owner. You're someone who's not getting paid to do this. You're somebody who's volunteering to pay to create this thing. It's just a different conversation. Um, and so that is really helpful um, for, for myself and for staff um, to have um, that support from all of the board to reach out to people you know and remind them why you think this is important. Because some of them are attentive to this and some of them are not so much. Um, so your opinion makes a difference with a lot of those folks. Did we, on, on S part, SP2, mm -hmm. did we have a, we had some kind of a meeting? Did we have like an open house or something where we invited mm -hmm. in May. Other, uh, when we were setting it up and ahead of the petition process? So each one is different we and one. we raise, so we raise this, but usually, um, usually during um, petition phase, we do host, uh, most bids opt to host one or more meetings. It does depend a bit on the bid, though. So, for example, there are bids where you don't get good turnout for meetings. In that case, some bids opt to go kind of door to door and try to contact each individual owner. So each bid's different. This is a fairly large bid. I think that certainly makes sense. There will probably also be some opportunities. Um, I know you have a lot of your condos in this area are run by uh, some of the same management companies. We will try to reach out to them and ask them to disseminate our materials to the residents, um, things like that. So it's there's a broad outreach campaign, and keep in mind, you know, everything we work with, um, everything we do, we get from it, it originates from assessor's data and what we're able to add to it, which is just legal owner name and mailing address. So we mail every owner in the district. Actually, reaching people by email and phone. Is, is doable in as much as we have contact information for people or can find it. And I'll be honest with you, I would say no matter how hard you try, there is probably, at least in, in most bids, there's at least, there are at least 20% of the property owners you can't find. If the legal owner's name is John Smith or, or, or uh, Michael Jacobs, you can't find them. I mean, there's just, there's simply, quite frankly, too many of them to figure out which one is the property owner. Um, if the ownership name is uh, Lightyear Investments LLC and they don't have any of their directors or officers, you can't find those people online, you don't know who that is. So there are some owners, no matter how hard you try, you'll never be able to reach them by phone or email. Um, and there are many owners who you will, if you call them and email them, and mail them, they still won't answer you or want to talk to you. So, um, but that said, there I think because this is an existing bid, you have a tremendous amount of 
contact information for a lot of your owners, so that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, outreach is not perfect, and you know we, we mail to everyone. Some people don't update their address promptly with the county assessor, so they may not get the mailing. So we're we the mailing is the mailing is required. We go well above and beyond that to the greatest extent. We can. And, and I will add too that uh, the the uh, contributors, the highest contributors to our assessments are people and organizations that we have decent communication with generally. So, you know, I'm in the process of doing an analysis of our database and seeing, all right, what does the top 51% look like and how many of these people do we have direct communication with and if not, how do we cultivate that now? Um, and it's looking good. I mean, I'm not, I'm not nervous. I think what it's what it's going to come down to is the legwork of making sure that we're actually making sure that we're receiving those signed petitions and ballots on time. Um, it clearly that, changes once all the construction is finished. I mean, that, <coughs> the mm -hmm. entire dynamic of who is yeah. the bigger party at the table. Absolutely. Changes, right? So how do you measure that? I mean, if something's under construction, it doesn't have a certificate of occupancy. Are you basically looking at the lot value? Yeah. Or the lot it's going to change. Yeah. 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 So, in other words, until so, when you develop a property, um, even from the time that you complete that property and start selling those units, it's sometimes more than a year before that gets recorded with the assessor. So, for example, I'm trying to remember if any subdivisions have been recorded in South Park 2. I want to say that there might have been one building that is recorded, but there's like no data for it yet. It, the APNs are there, but they haven't even, it, the, um, the lot, the building, it's our, none of that data is there yet when I last looked. I think, and I think there was only, only one building. So we have the APNs, but we have none of the data for it yet. So um, it is possible that a couple of those buildings could get recorded while we go through this process, and if so, we do update that as we go through it. Um, but otherwise, uh, once we, and we update that even through the petition phase, any of those changes, um, if we become aware of them, uh, and also through ballot stage. Once it's adopted by city council, we do no longer maintain that. At that point, the bid annually has to prepare an assessment role, and so the bid will check for those parcel changes. Um, and those should now be put in the database as well. Um, uh, <laughs> and they already know, they're already on top of this. <laughs> um, uh, and so anything that's not recorded by the time you finish the process this year will likely not be added until the following year. But technically, the bid can make mid-year adjustments. If you discover that those parcels have been recorded, you can certainly go in and update them, but if it's already been billed, you can't change the billing. I don't know if that makes sense. So usually parcel changes are captured annually, not once the bid is formed, they're captured annually. Up until we form it, we try to incorporate anything we become aware of, any changes. So, so if there are hiccups for the next couple of years because of the manual billing, everything's going to be different in two years anyways, given how much construction is going on. Right. Yes. Every, yeah, everything's going to be different in yeah. that year. And it'll be fewer owners to need to get buy-in from. Because that no, it'll be more owners. It'll be the opposite. It'll be more. Oh, because because the the yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. So it's actually, I mean, is it fair to say it's better to be on this side of the timeline than two years down the line? Just because well, of the wrangling of... You don't have to do it every year. You don't have to do it every year. Well, it's better. We, we yeah. do outreach to we do outreach to the homeowners, but I will say in most bids, it really matters in terms of homeowners. It matters who reads their mail. People who read their mail are probably three out of four will return it and sign it, and the rest they're really hard to get. They're hard to get to. So yes, condo owners are a tough outreach assignment. Um, um, and you can go meet with HOA boards, but they tend to be small. So you're really actually only reaching maybe seven owners in the building. So what I have found is more effective in like a district like downtown is to reach out to the condo management companies. If the HOAs want a presentation, we're happy to go do it. But really what our goal is, is to try to get the HOA management company 
to disseminate our materials via email so that maybe some of those people who don't bother to open their snail mail open their email because it comes from the management company. So that's prob that's more effective really than doing the HOA meetings at the end of the day. Mark, did you? Sarah, we have a, a recap of what the current rates are and what the changes to those rates that you described side by side. Uh, I do not have that with me, but basically um, what I can say is your current rates for 2017 is exactly what you will be starting with in 2018, with the one exception I described, the condo rate, the condo rate in South Park 2 is going to go from 30 cents to 30 cents. So that's the only change. So whatever you're paying now will be the same for year one. So there's no increase. There's no increase between 2017 rate and 2018 rate, except for the one I described. And the assessment methodology is the same. Yes. The boundaries will be the same. The assessment methodology is the same. We just have that sticky thing because you did you raised assessments in one and not the other. So we have we have to resolve that. And that's really the only good way. That's the most defensible, logical way to resolve it. And the decision behind that was that the, the SP2 had only been in existence for two years, so it, it was hard to justify raising the rates that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it's now It will now be three years, so we want to get them on the same page for the room. Or for the new room. Yes, and going forward, I would advise you, um, so your residential condos have a very clear articulation for why they have a separate rate established. Um, but I would recommend that for your residential condos, regardless of where they are, the new combined bid <coughs> raise or raise them or keep them the same for all. Um, for commercial parcels, you have different zones and different um, different rationales for those zones and, and services, and they generally kind of relate to your land uses and different needs for those different land uses. Um, so, but we're going to add um, language to the plan. Um, uh, better language than exists now um, uh, that clearly gives you um, the option to consider increases by zone rather than purely just district as a whole. And that, and that makes sense because as a district changes over time, one zone's needs may change while another zone's needs don't. So, um, you know, and a lot of that is triggered by development. So changes in development trigger different needs. So it's good to have that flexibility. And I always try to build in as much flexibility for you as I can. Um, because at the end of the day, you're building a budget and a plan for five years. And it's impossible to anticipate everything that will change in five years. So it's good to have a little flexibility. And the map is the same configuration. Yes, I, I brought that primarily just so that um, if anybody here was trying to figure out, okay, who's who's impacted, who's who's currently at 30 cents and going up to 33, if you have a condo in that area, this effect, what I'm telling you affects you. So I brought that. that that's the reason for the map. It's just uh, for you, to, in case you didn't know where your property was. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so if you do have follow-up questions after this sort of settles in, please feel free to reach out to me, um, and I will help field, field those answers. And with that, I'd like to move on and pass the baton over to Sergio. He's going to give a, a quick, clean and safe update um, to the SP2 bit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, let me start off with what a year. I can't believe it's been... <laughs> a full year of maintaining 22 blocks of South Park 2. Um, I hope everybody that has gone through SP2 has seen a dramatic difference from when we started um, through the course of the year and going forward. Um, just a few numbers uh, that count. Um, last year we ended up with 63.8 tons of trash collected um, for, for SB2. Uh, let's see, um, we used about 3,000 gallons of water for pressure washing 
uh, certain areas to get them up to par. Um, we completed about 405 uh, block bases of weed abatement. And with this recent rain and showers, uh, they are popping up like mushrooms again, and we're back at it. Uh, graffiti removal is a challenge and continues to be a challenge. Uh, when we started the year, um, and Matt Sunil is, is here because his area was uh, an art gallery, <laughs> to say the least. They're just my hero. <laughs> uh, so we, we targeted, uh, the first four months we targeted uh, to try to get the biggest portion off the streets, which was the big graffiti tags and trash. Um, in April, then we brought in the safety aspect into South Park 2, which started to change a little bit the dynamics as well in the district. But, um, you know, we got some good uh, active property owners like Mr. Sunil that will um, notify us if we have graffiti that's in his area or on his streets or on his building. But uh, the, I say we have um, job security because we take off the graffiti in the morning and <laughs> back in the afternoon or back in the evening and we're back at it again. Um, so, I mean, am I right or am I right? You're right. Um, so, uh, right now, uh, up to date, we have picked up <coughs> 9.5 tons of trash. And that, I think, increased by trying to be a little bit of the proactive side with the addition of trash cans in, in SB2 to try to alleviate some of the public generated trash on the streets and so forth, well, we've not now actually become, and I wish I had not forgotten my PowerPoint presentation at home, but we've actually become uh, some business owners, uh, personal garbage collectors. Because the areas that we've placed these trash cans, the business owners from either right in front or neighboring not bring out their trash so we can throw it away. Um, and that has increased the amount of trash that now we're throwing away. Uh, same period last year, uh, we were not even close to nine tons yet. And for the first month and what, two weeks, we're close to 10, 10 tons of trash. So that's increased. Um, Do you know that that's not the point? Do you know that that's not the point? Have you talked to them? Uh, I've talked to a few, um, and the common question is that that's not my trash. Mm. I mean, we're, we're going to be putting signs to low dumping signs but and see if that makes any difference. Yeah. Um, but it seems to be this incentivization now that it's like, well, the trash is getting picked up anyway, might as well throw these six bags, these yeah, large bags of trash and next and to it. Our, our, our yeah. uh, at least my philosophy is that by the end of the day, the guys know that regardless if it's additional trash or somebody else's trash, until we get identified and who we need to specifically speak to, the trash will get picked up. Right. Um, we've also had an increase of illegal dumping, illegal dumping meaning, um, Desks, refrigerators, TV sets, um, you know, mattresses um, that are being dumped on the streets. And, you know, uh, we, cor we um, coordinate with the city to have them pick up the large items because we don't have the, the, not only the manpower, the capabilities of throwing these large items, uh, items away. Um, but that has also increased in, in SP2. So is this uh, centralized uh, throughout, or is there a specific area that they're targeting the dump? The cameras, the lighting, It is, well, let me, let me correct that. Uh, Margo Street is a 
dumping street because one, it's secluded, um, uh, doesn't have too much uh, walkway of pedestrian traffic. Um, so that, that particular area is considered a dumping ground. However, if you look at the bigger picture, it's very sporadic. Um, <coughs> and we find stuff. Um, but that, that's increased as, as well. So Jerry, you also saw a tick when we installed the new, the new trash cans, right? What was that? When we installed the new trash cans last year, end of last year, we had 14 new bins. We mm -hmm. saw a tick um, when those were actually set out on the on the sidewalks, right? An increase. An increase. Oh, I was going to ticks. I mean, Sorry. <laughs> ticks. We saw an increase out. of uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. next to they're, those they're bins. Being, they're being utilized, yeah. believe me. Um, we're also having a little issue with our homeless population because once we switch out the bags, they go in and take the plastic bags for their use and leave, again, the, just the container. So, you know, challenges arise. However, um, again, hopefully the, the property owners, business owners, um, have seen a difference in SB2 from when we started uh, a year ago until now and, and continuing on. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, YMCA, uh, yep. this, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, gets uh, the taggers quite frequently and we're there every day trying to take care of the <coughs> office as well as uh, Mr. Steele's property. So, um, uh, that's all I have. I, I wish I brought some uh, show and tell, but uh, I'll promise I'll, I'll show and tell next next board meeting. Um, so I'm only responsible for the 22 blocks of SB2. Uh, SB1, of course, is taken care of by my partner, Victor, uh, who is with uh, the Los Angeles Conservation Board, and he takes care of SB1. So, um, so if you have any questions on SB1, I'm sorry, I can't answer. Yes. yes. Uh, with the uh, onset of the rains, uh, do you think you can use more water to <coughs> power wash the sidewalks in a more frequent manner? And in those areas, we can not, which, which hasn't been gotten any power washing in the past year and a half? Uh, not until the city lifts off, uh, lifts the uh, ban on um, water usage. Um, but again, we're still targeting those areas that are of public health risk, for example, areas that are used as public restrooms, uh, Margo Street, um, that are used, you know, people urinating or defecating on, on the roadways or the aisles or, or I, excuse me, the, um, alleyways. So we're still targeting those. Um, and with um, the bus stops, we target that every other uh, month where the Metro has their company that comes out and does the cleaning of them and when it gets really bad we go out and support them. But we don't, I mean 3,000 gallons when we started out last year, I think that's a lot of water just to get some of the stuff that really need to come off. Um, and that's so, just SP2. And that, yeah. Yeah, the drought's lasted a long time. We had and we've had this border ban for like what well, seems like three, four years. And it's like, yeah, I think we've been in drought for many years now. Yeah. So. I used to water my property every Friday. That before the water ban, and mm -hmm. it's not been watered in like four years. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yes. I don't think it's really um, for you, but. Getting back to the, the the new bid, right now SP2 services are not 24 hours. So will the management plan, the new management plan, address mm -hmm. the district as a whole, and we'll all have the same services theoretically, or could it be by zone? Or so the way that we are revisiting our contracts with. Um LA Conservation Corps and Street Plus is looking at having LA Conservation Corps handle all cleaning for the entire, all clean services for the entire bid, 
and um, Street Plus handling all safe services for the entire bid. The routes do vary just based well, on. Well, my question was not so much like as to who does what, because that really does need to be bid out. My, my question was what type of service are we going to look at? In, in the various areas, irrespective of who's going to, the sure. hours of the sure. hours of service. So right now, <coughs> SB2 doesn't have 24 hour mm -hmm. clean and I think <coughs> very limited safety, which we just started doing 